when you suggest to an editor that you want to use that word, um, it has to be wrapped in lead, you have to be escorted by two armed security people uh, around the newsroom. It's really, really, even when someone's dead to rights, you find some sort of... I mean, see, they're trying to do it in yeah. <laughs> Even if you got it dead to rights, it really is a hard word to use. Why? Myra? Well, I want to tell you that when I wrote my book, Simon & Schuster had an absolute fit about the title. They kept saying, we want something classy, like the Eye of Stone American Journalist. And I said, no, no, all governments lie, all governments lie. That's the best thing he ever said, although he said many brilliant things. And uh, the other side of his quote was, but disaster lies in wait for the country whose leaders smoke the same hashish they give out. <laughs> so anyway, I, um, I, you know, one of the reasons I wrote about it is he was when he died. Uh, all of these people who had um, overlooked him and called him a communist and said he was absolutely out of the, out of the mainstream, we're all giving hosannas to this great man, and I found the hypocrisy of that was enormous. And so then I went back through and found out a lot about Izzy. I'm not going to take up the time now, but I, I've got a couple of wonderful anecdotes that I'd like to tell you that, had, that we didn't get into the do wonderful documentary. Dan, because of that reluctance, do you end up with uh, an audience, readers, viewers, listeners, who are unable or unwilling to hear that word? Well, you know, a couple of things have actually changed. Uh, one is, is Donald Trump. In fact, when I was writing my column at the Washington Post website, uh, the only word that would ever get immediately stricken from anything I wrote was, was lying. Um, and I think that uh, I think that was a shame. Because it's down here, like the Park Foundation and the Knight Foundation and Jeremy's own foundation, Jeremy Stoltz, that helped uh, to put money into this film and are now helping us uh, with the outreach of the film, getting it into journalism and schools and that sort of thing. But I think it is interesting that Fred's, uh, although he worked for many years in the United States, you know, he's a Canadian, I'm a Canadian, it's a Canadian production company and uh, it's a Canadian film. I think with the way we define that in Canada for funding purposes is it's a film made by a Canadian. It doesn't matter where it's made or who's who are the characters in it. So well, I mean, we ended with a Canadian. Well, we have Peter Jennings <laughs> being there, uh, coming back to, to Izzy. And, but I do think, yeah, I think Canadians, because we live, uh, we're sleeping with the elephant, as uh, our, our previous Trudeau Prime Minister used to say, that we do have a way of looking at this beast uh, slightly outside and, and understanding and appreciating some of the craziness and the nuances. You know, Fred, a lot of Americans, well, they would just lose their minds. They wouldn't know where to begin with this because there is a widespread conviction, religious almost, that the news business in the United States is just incorrigibly leftist, left-leaning, um, uh, socialist sympathizing and on and on and on and the idea that um, millionaire leftists work for the biggest corporations on the planet doesn't doesn't seem to jangle with them at all and, and they would just reject the premises of this movie from the get-go unless they're under the age of 30 that's the hope that's the good news and uh, I actually as I was making this film, uh, always had in mind that I, I, I want to make a film that will will have a you know a shelf life and will be seen in journalism schools all over the U.S., Canada, beyond. Uh, because I think, uh, well, for one thing, no one knows about I have Stone these days. But but more importantly, I was surprised at how often I would talk to people uh, about the film that I was planning and I'd find out that. Uh, so few people knew about democracy now. Uh, so few people knew about the intercept. Um, it's, uh, 
it's almost like you have to be an investigative journalist to find out where the independent investigative journalism is. It's what takes work, you know, and it's not being advertised on billboards and the sides of buses the way that, you know, your local TV news hour is, is advertising itself. So, um, I'm rambling, but... Uh, well, no, I, I think that le leads us to, to Peter Stone because uh, at one point Glenn Greenwald refers to I.F. Stone as the first blogger. And what's wonderful about that is that for those who remember those days, I.F. Stone's work often subtly, quietly injected into the bloodstream of the news business stories that would finally become stories only later on. Uh, but they would start there. The unthinkable would be thought there first and then finally make the paper or the broadcast two or three months later when they'd run it down using independent means. But that's an important role. Yeah, I think it is an important role. And uh, just to disagree with one thing that Fred said, I think there's, you know, the, the film resonates too with people who are over a certain age also. <laughs> people who came you know, people who came of age in the 60s uh, and the 50s and 70s when Izzy was writing, first publishing the Weekly, which started in the height of the Cold War, out of the McCarthy period, and then became a Bible for people in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement, during the uh, anti-Vietnam War protests, um, when a lot of its muckraking, including the big expose about the Tonkin Gulf incident, uh, was, was, was widely read, uh, and at least in campuses and in some newsrooms, uh, Izzy had a lot of fans at the Washington Post, young reporters there who idolized him, and some older reporters who idolized him too. But he did say one thing in the film where someone commented on his critique of the Washington Post, which was true, and I used to hear it, that you find the most amazing stories on page 17, or the most amazing news buried in the you know, 14th paragraph. And that sort of was his technique in putting together the weekly. That was one of the things that made the weekly a strong, uh, newsy publication. And exciting was how he was able to go through the papers, tear them apart, find the relevant paragraph and the, and the relevant fact, and highlight that. And he did it with boxes on the front page of his little four-page weekly. He did it with humor, which was also, I think Michael Moore correctly pointed out, was part of what made him um, popular and part of what made him readable that he had zingers in his copy and he and he wrote you know he wrote extremely well and wrote with a great style and verb and it wasn't just you know it wasn't just digging through documents he had a passion in the writing too which contributed to his you know popularity and contributed to his reputation if, if i may just interject um i was at the post in that period of time and I interviewed, and it was actually a golden time when Ben Bradley ran, ran it, and it was a place where he used to say, you know, MacPherson, you know, we're running this, but you goddamn well better be right, which would scare you to death for a whole night, morning, waking up and saying, what did you do wrong? But basically, I asked him why he never ran Izzy, because there were people uh, jockeying for that, wanting it to get there. And a very weak answer, he said, oh, he wouldn't want to work for us, it's, it's too inside. And of course, it was just that they were up, up, still frightened of him, no matter the people who were pushing him. But the, the thing that people are not quite getting is that Izzy was this fantastic uh, individual reporter in the 30s and 40s, at a time when uh, there were liberal newspapers, and he did one of these great exposés of J. Edgar Hoover, and I'm going to just read because I want to make sure it's accurate, and it's a long quote. But he had a he did not just always do the documents. He had people inside. He used to say, "Don't go to the top. Go to the bowels of people in the government. They're the ones who are distressed at the horrible stuff they're seeing, and they will give you information." He learned very early on, and no one else had run it, that the uh, financial and corporate world was supporting uh, Nazi Germany after we were in war. And that became a cause celeb 25 years later. So he was brilliant, but the one thing, this major scoop 
from an informant in 1943, um, it, it instilled the undying enmity of the mendacious and malevolent J. Edgar Hoover, who then took 5,000 pages to, to uh, try to convince the world that Izzy was a communist. But anyway, this was a, this invasion of privacy that government workers were subjected to, and it still remains chilling. Bannered in the nation, it was called Gestapo tactics. Hoover's FBI spies were ordered to report on questions and uh, of people, and these were the questions. Does he mix with Negroes? Does he seem to have too many Jewish friends? Does his face light up when the Red Army is mentioned? <laughs> Does he turn first to Russian news in the paper? Is he always criticizing Vichy France, of course, which is then an ally with the Nazis? Is he faithful to his wife? Does he think the colored races are as good as the white? Why do you suppose he has hired so many Jews? Is it true that he reads the nation and the new republic? Does he buy out-of-town newspapers? How often does he read PM? Another very liberal paper. Does he talk a lot against the poll tax, which of course excluded blacks from voting? Do you think he is excessive in opposing fascism or Nazism? Does he support the newspaper guilt? And finally, did you ever hear him whistle or sing the communistic international or other subversive songs? <laughs> and so when I was looking at the 5,000 files, I saw this note from uh, Hoover, who went absolutely ballistic, and he said, what do we have on him? You know, I mean, his own handwriting slashed across the top. And from then on, I mean, they would, they would catch him going into cigar stores. They would catch him having such clandestine mailing with his hearing aid company. And that, and that was the other story. The hearing aid company, he was going deaf and blind in the 30s and 40s which most people didn't know and he didn't want to talk about. But um, David Brinkley tells this wonderful story about how the um, uh, General Motors head, Charles, named Charlie Knudsen, was pleading for the, uh, after, even after uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, to, to just keep on making cars for the whole automotive industry. So he came in and it was a locked door and closed out uh, press and so Izzy took his hearing aid uh, mm -hmm. re receiver and put it on the door and turned the volume up <laughs> and he was able to hear them saying no Charlie and as Brinkley wrote he said with those two words the FDR administration brought the largest industry in the world to its heels and it was Izzy who did that so he was a very, very indefatigable uh, guy. And he always used to say, and I think this was what we showed in so well in this document, and it's wonderful, is that his line was, uh, in Washington, you really have to wear your chastity belt to preserve your journalistic integrity. Yeah. <laughs> he, he said, as soon as the State Department official asks you to lunch, and uh, then ask your opinion, you're sunk. And we, you know, how many times do you watch Chris Matthews talk about my good friend and it's some source? I mean, it's just ludicrous the way these people feel this, I mean, the indelicate word is access horse, and it's not just their fault because the producers of the newspapers and the uh, um, major mainstream television want that access. They want to have lunch with the president. They but want the, the scary part, Myra, is that nobody is embarrassed by it. Exactly. I mean, we had Easton Jordan yeah. basically telling the story yes. of bringing his list of generals to the Pentagon to be approved. How do you like my generals, basically? We got a big thumbs and up. And we got a big thumbs up from those generals. What do you know? And, and then you now have um, Trump saying he's got all these generals and military people on his side, and that's supposed to be considered okay. I mean, I know that the papers have gotten better, but they were reprehensible as well as the media. Two billion dollars uh, of free media 
is what Trump got. That's ended in March. So you, I, I really love what this uh, documentary has done because it, it has brought it all up to date and showing us these real pitfalls. But I don't know, Dan, if you really even need to undermine people. You just think the way, the way Myra was telling us about I have Stone, now you can just ignore them. Pay, pay attention to the anchors of the big three and just ignore Amy Goodman and Juan Gonzalez and yeah. ignore Jeremy Scale. Well, and even ignore the, the anchors of the big three, which don't really exist anymore. You, 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 you compartmentalize your media consumption. Um, and so people can just pick what, what reality they want, to, they want to subscribe to. But I, I, want to, I want to say one thing that I think that was too optimistic about the movie and about I have stand. Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> but, you know the, the idea that, uh, as Myra said, you can go talk to low-level government workers, which was one of the I have stand secrets, or that you can get the story by reading the documents, uh, the government documents, or that you can get the story by reading the 48th paragraph of the Washington Post. Those things are less true. I think the secrecy is more um, more oppressive than it ever has been. People will not talk to you. You, you go to try and talk to the local level government employee, they are terrified. They will not talk to you. The government documents are you know, really quite uh, opaque. There's a, there's a low level standard of, of truthfulness in them, and so they've gotten to be not very useful. The uh, oversight hearings that used to be such a, you know, that, that people like Morton Mintz and I have Stone and so on mine for great stories are, are a joke. Um, and and uh, so and there's so the, a bipartisan problem, isn't it? Dan? Yes, absolutely. But the uh, there's one sort of ray of good news, though, which uh, which is this new wave of, of whistleblowing yeah. and hacking. And we're in this very awkward position. You should go look at the Intercept this, this evening. We have a big story about uh, the Hillary Clinton's uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of Goldman Sachs speeches transcripts. Sorry excerpts of them have finally been leaked by these hackers. The hackers are most likely Russian intelligence. Um, so this is how we are finding out how our government works now. And it's, 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 it's awful. We saw uh, chunks of North Vietnam, North Vietnam blowing up uh, in the later parts of the film, Peter. And I'm wondering if the American audience all these years on, has been trained to not want to hear it. Whether the problem is not that you couldn't find out, but that you couldn't even tell it now. If there was a Milai in Iraq, and I, I use if yeah. advisedly because I'm sure there is a Milai in Iraq. There was an Abu Ghraib. Right, right. There's a, a sizable enough part of the population that would cover its eyes and say, la, 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 I don't want to know. And that's a hard audience to work for. It's an interesting time to look at Syria, though. I mean, right now in Syria, we are seeing some incredible atrocities. And I think we may see you know, a shift in public opinion coming around uh, to recognizing after you know, months and months of what's going on there, in terms of, I'm thinking particularly about bombing hospitals by the Syrian government and by the Russians, and killing of children, uh, which has become a real horrendous story. And it's one that I think is beginning to get through. I mean, it seemed for months that John Kerry was not, not was willing to go the extra mile to negotiate with the Russians. He may have finally, or the U.S. may have finally reached a limit in terms of negotiating with the Russians given their you know, continued bombing of hospitals. And uh, this is a, a different kind of example, but I think it speaks a bit to, you know, I think what you were suggesting was that we, we're, you know, we don't recognize these you know, atrocities any longer because we've seen them so much and we've become sort of immune to them. But Milai was eventually told in every bit of gruesome detail by, by, an, major, by an independent reporter named Seymour Hurt. Oh, yes, it's right. it started there, but eventually was covered yes. by all major media. Sure. And I'm wondering whether in 2016 or 2017, uh, some major media outlets might just consider it too hot to touch. 
Well, you know, Ray, I think one of the problems is, and I just read this poll that said that uh, because of after ISIS and after all of the the hoopla about terrorism, even though your chances of having a terrorist attack are minimal, but if the scare and fear tactic, according to this poll, it said that the majority of people would rather give up their civil liberties to have safety. And uh, so you're, you're reaching an audience right now that has been scared in, in a large way about this international scourge. And they are really not wanting to hear these stories. And you just saw that, that guy from CBS, you know, that's just all we want is to make money. You know, look at this, let's put the Kardashians on, let's put this on. And the public is kind of, I think, numb to wanting to hear the real stories anymore. So that being said, Peter and Fred, take us home. Um, what do you want this movie to do? Quickly, because uh, we're, we're going to ramp up. Uh, what do you want this movie to do? Who do you think is going to see it? What is, what's the takeaway when they walk out of the theater or walk away from their screen at home eventually? The Oscars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hope that it um, opens people's eyes to uh, the, the, the vibrant independent journalism community that is out there that many of them don't know about. Uh, and, and it makes them realize why the, the values of the people working in that community are, are perhaps a bit different, or not just the values of the people, but the, the, the structures that they work within uh, are not the same as, as the large corporate news organizations, uh, which have many outstanding journalists working in them, but they can only go so far because of the system and the structure that they're in and the stories that they will get approved. So I hope it will make people watch the news differently and read the news differently. And we hope that it will encourage uh, a new generation of young journalists, as like some of the ones you saw at the end there, head of the college, who are learning now about Izzy Stone and, and are inspired by people like Greenwald and Scahill and the folks at The Intercept and Democracy Now. I think there is that the groundswell from below, from the new generation, who get don't get their news from the New York Times and CBS and CNN, but are, are finding the truth elsewhere uh, online. Well, I, read a, I had another little uh, theme I wanted to bring up, which wasn't touched in the film, which I'll segue to. I, 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 that, like, that I will use two minutes of my time. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that Izzy said, and I think Myra's it's quoted in her book and quoted in other uh, you know, biographies of Izzy, is that um, he had so much fun. I had so much fun that I ought to be arrested. <laughs> and we saw all this very serious work of investigative journalism, and which is laborious and uh, time consuming, and going through documents, which I've done at times, looking for facts about the Jack Abramoff scandal in different places, the congressional record, and in Senate offices of travel records and things like that. But there's a moment when you find a document, for instance, the aha moment, where you know you've got, as Izzy said in the film, I think, you know, you, you can hoist this guy on his own petard, essentially. You've got the document that proves or shows the corruption or the, you know, mendacity that you've suspected all along. So there's a lot of fun in it, too. And he liked that fun. I mean, and, and you know, Myra and I have other stories about he was well known as loving to go dancing, and um, I'll let Myra tell the story about San Francisco and yeah, a, a disco. Nice. The disco called, um, oh, I'm blowing in. Uh, dance your ass off. Dance your ass off. And, and, and uh, he, when he was uh, still having a hard time hearing, he would dance because he could feel the rhythms through his feet. And uh, there was just this incredible, human side to him and uh, one of the things and he finally had a, a, a um, hearing um, operation in the late 60s but up till then and he would dance and everybody would say he was really a very bad dancer <laughs> but he didn't care he would, and he told me he said oh I love dancing you know in the 60s it's so free you don't have to hold on to anybody you can just go out there and twirl around and, and so there's these other sides but I wanted to say an optimistic thing. I think that this is all cyclical. Uh, there are 
people like the great Molly Ivins who followed Izzy and, and she has her followers and a lot of people today do. Izzy was in love with the muckrakers uh, who came before him and the socialists. That was a very strong part of it. And we end up with Obama taking the 1917 Alien and Sedition Act that they used against uh, Eugene Debs and gave him 10 years for being against World War I. It has now been reinstituted and that's how we have people like Chelsea Manning in prison for 35 years, even though we saw on this film the, shoot, the, the, the helicopter shooting the innocent people on the street. That came from Chelsea Manning. So we have a real tough time trying to prove that we, that the United States can get outraged, like you said. But I think it's up to the journalists, the independent ones, to do it. Byron McPherson, Peter Raymond, Fred Peabody, Peter Stone, Dan Funken, thank you very much.